Hey everyone, welcome in. I'm Dr. Jim Cellini. I'm a board certified and practicing veterinary neurologist. There's been record breaking warm weather across the world this summer and to help seek relief from sweltering heat, many people look to bodies of water to cool off and go swimming. In July of this year, state health officials in Georgia and Nevada both reported cases of people dying from brain eating amoeba after swimming in fresh water in those respective states. While cases of brain eating amoeba are fortunately quite rare, they are almost uniformly fatal. According to the CDC, between 1962 in 2022, there were 157 known infected individuals and only four of those people survived the infection. And this equates to a fatality rate of 97%. In case you were wondering, humans are not the only species that can contract brain-eating amoeba infections. So in this video, I'm going to talk about this rare but quite scary condition as it relates to dogs and people. So put that tap water-filled neti pot down, smash the like and subscribe button, and let's get started with the video. All right, so to start with, what is brain-eating amoeba? So in people, the specific organ of concern here is called Nigleria phalari. I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. But in phalari is what's called an amoeba, which is a single-celled organism commonly found in warm, fresh water like rivers, lakes, and hot springs, and even soil. Only one species seems to infect people, and it's the specific one in phalari. The amoeba infects people when water containing the amoeba enters the body through the nose, which happens when people go swimming in these bodies of water and they get water up their nose. Once in the nose, it's able to travel through the nose, penetrate the skull, and enter the brain, where it causes is what's called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, or PAM. PAM is almost always fatal, and according to the CDC, people cannot become infected by drinking water or through aerosol droplets or water vapor, which is reassuring to say the least. The amoeba thrives in heat and likes warm water, which is why you typically see cases during the summer months. So how does it affect dogs? In Phalari has been reported to infect cattle and other species, but from what I was able to research, does not infect dogs. I wasn't able to find any case reports of this infecting dogs. That doesn't mean dogs can't get brain-eating amoeba or their own version of PAM. The dog version of this disease is caused by an organism called acanth amoeba. And this specific group of amoeba are the most common types of amoeba found in soil and water samples. The organism has been isolated from basically any source of water or moisture you can think of, from seawater to sewage to shower heads, air conditioning units, humidifiers, you name it. But despite its ubiquity, dogs rarely get infected by this organism. And it seems that despite likely being exposed to the organism, all the time, infections rarely take hold because a normal, well-functioning immune system seems to be enough to prevent infection. So when dogs do get infected, they are typically already immunosuppressed by either a disease that they already have or through treatment for an immune-mediated condition where you're trying to suppress their immune system function in the first place. One case report from the University of Georgia published in 2011 talks about a boxer that was treated for immune-mediated meningitis called SRMA, or steroid responsive meningitis arteritis. The treatment for this condition is to suppress the immune system because Believe it or not, meningitis in dogs is almost always due to an overactive immune system rather than an infection. This dog was treated and initially did well as they often do with this SRMA condition, but then three weeks later, the dog died suddenly due to a secondary infection with acanth amoeba. It was theorized that this dog contracted amoeba from somewhere in the environment, anywhere, as I mentioned previously. Given the fact that the amoeba is basically everywhere, there's no way to know for sure where exactly this dog contracted it from. And it should also be noted that this dog contracted more of a systemic amoeba infection involving the lungs and the kidneys, but not the brain. Another case report published in the journal Veterinary Parasitology in 2014 documented a case of a young Spanish water dog presenting for fever and stiff neck that was diagnosed with acanth amoeba meningoencephalitis by spinal tap. Despite having a diagnosis relatively quickly in this case, this dog unfortunately succumbed very quickly to the disease and was euthanized within a day. The interesting aspect of this case report was the investigation that was done afterwards. The dog's owners reported that the dog dog often played and drank from a hot spring near their home in Tenerife. Researchers tested water from this hot spring directly and were able to identify the same amoeba genotype as was seen in this dog's nervous system. I thought this was an interesting finding because how often are you able to find a source of an infection like this? And in doing so, these veterinarians were able to notify public health officials to make them aware and see if they need to do anything special about this and notify the public. This is also a really good example of how veterinary medicine plays a role with public health itself. Another case report I found published in 2005 describes a one-year-old Labrador retriever dying from systemic amoebiasis, and another case report in 2020 described a six-month-old Staffordshire Terrier succumbing to the disease as well. Both reports describe a very rapid onset of symptoms involving altered behavior, muscle stiffness, seizures, and death occurring within about 24 hours. Unlike the Spanish water dog, these dogs were diagnosed post-mortem, but similar to the Spanish water dog, these dogs also had a rapidly progressing disease course resulting in death within a couple of days at most. 
Now it should be noted that the symptoms exhibited by the dogs in these case reports are not specific to amoeba and can be caused by many other types of conditions affecting the brain and other organs of the body. It should also be noted that some of the dogs in these case reports did not have any evidence of immunosuppression or otherwise impaired immune system function, so it's unclear why these dogs were susceptible to infection by these amoeba. So to review, the symptoms of brain-eating amoeba in dogs can appear very suddenly and can include things outside of the nervous system as well. Symptoms like fever, headache, which in dogs is manifested by acting head shy, meaning not wanting to be touched around the head and face. They'll kind of do this when you try to touch around their face. I know that's a terrible impression. Other symptoms include seizures, vomiting, lethargy, loss of balance, difficulty walking, bleeding disorders, which can include petechia. Petechia are little red spots that you can observe on their skin and mucous membranes, which indicates something is going haywire with the blood clotting system in their bodies. And as a side note, anytime you see petechia, I would have your dog checked out by a veterinarian immediately. Now, another unique aspect of amoeba infections in dogs and cats, specifically cats in this case, is corneal ulcers. The amoeba can infect the cornea specifically and cause what is called amoeba keratitis. The corneal ulcer in this case has a somewhat unique presentation in that a ring infiltrate forms around the infected area. These ulcers offer probably the best method of diagnosing an amoeba infection in pets because you can perform what's called a corneal scrape, where you take a little bit of the cornea and put it onto a slide and look at it under a microscope. You can actually see the amoeba cells under a microscope. Other than demonstration of amoeba cytologically under the microscope with a tissue sample anti-mortem before death, good testing methodologies in pets are kind of hard to come by. In people, there are PCR tests available for acanth amoeba and enphalari, but to my knowledge, these aren't readily available in dogs in any real capacity. And the Spanish water dog I talked about before, they were able to see the amoeba under a spinal fluid sample, so just looking at it under a microscope was how they diagnosed it. But let me know in the comments if you know otherwise, as I wasn't able to find much about diagnosing this condition and this amoeba anti-mortem in dogs. Now, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any good treatment options for amoeba infections once they've infected multiple organs or disseminated to the central nervous system. And the prognosis is, as with people, generally grave. You notice all of the case reports I mentioned, dogs that come to the disease within a day or two. Treatment is supportive and may include antibiotics, anti-inflammatory drugs, IV fluids, and other methodologies. But the prognosis is considered very poor and most dogs are going to succumb within a few days of becoming infected. It should also be reported that the symptoms they're showing are nonspecific, so it's hard to know that you're treating an amoeba in the first place if you can't get that definitive diagnosis. Now, in regards to enphalari, again, the human brain-eating amoeba, there is a protocol used that involves antibiotics, antifungals, steroids, and other measures all aimed at reducing brain swell. One drug in particular that's part of this protocol is called miltificine. This drug is used in dogs to treat leishmaniasis, and it works by inducing apoptosis or cell death within the actual protozoal cell itself. And it has been shown to kill enphalari in the lab and is often used in people to try to do the same thing. Now, I wasn't able to find examples of its use in dogs for anything outside of leishmaniasis. But as a neurologist, I can tell you that if I ever do come across a case of this or what I suspect to be an amoeba infection, I will be looking to use this protocol and this drug as something to try and mimic this treatment protocol. In theory, the best way to prevent brain eating or otherwise amoeba infections in dogs is to avoid letting them swim in or drink contaminated water. But if you have a dog like, say, a Labrador retriever who lives near water and likes their exercise, I mean, good luck trying to keep them out of the water. They're going to be Labradors. Also, since species like acanth amoeba are basically ubiquitous, meaning they're everywhere, they're probably exposed to the organism on a daily basis already and have been many times already in their life. But if you can try to avoid warmer bodies of fresh water, I'd probably at least try to avoid those specific spots with your own pet. Now, since immunosuppression seems to be a major factor in allowing for amoeba infections, I think the key here is to focus on keeping your pet's immune system as healthy and well-functioning as it can be. Giving them a healthy diet, plenty of exercise, positive reinforcement, and engaging activities should all help to support their general well-being here and by extension, their immune system function. Now, sometimes your pet has to be immunosuppressed for various autoimmune conditions like meningitis or hemolytic anemia and many other things. And in these instances, I would probably probably want to take some precautions to try to limit their exposure to bodies of warm water, and I would consider using filtration systems on water sources that they're drinking. The CDC has some really good guidelines regarding water filters that I'll list in the description below. So in conclusion, while dogs and cats can and do get amoeba infections of various kinds, the infamous brain-eating amoeba caused by enphalari in people doesn't seem to cause a problem in dogs or cats. And while it does infect other species, and other amoeba species can infect dogs and cats, the incidence is very low overall 
wrong. I personally am not going to worry about brain eating amoeba or other systemic amoeba infections in my pets because it's so rare. But if your pet is immunosuppressed and or frequently swims in warm, fresh water, it might be something I'd try to prevent and maybe at least think about have on the radar. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope this information was helpful to you. If you have any other questions, please feel free to leave a comment below. If you like this video, please smash that like and subscribe button and hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any other videos from my channel. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.